Hey everyone, I'm your host, Adrian. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. Thanks for joining in and happy June. Can you believe that it is June already? So with that, welcome to today's Rupa Live class presented by the all new Rupa University, the best way to learn about specialty lab work from industry experts. My name is Adrian Martinez and I will be your host for this afternoon. Today we have Dr. Jim Lavelle here to walk us through discovering the immune reaction to food, both sensitivities and allergies with Infinite Labs. Before jumping in, a couple of quick housekeeping items to go over. Everyone joining will be muted by default, but don't fret. If you have any questions, please use that Q&A button down in the menu bar, and we will host a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Immediately following that, we uh, will show you exactly how to order these tests on Rupa Health. And if you have to jump early, no worries at all. We will be sending out a recording of the session along with the slides in the next few days. And additionally, if you are a fan of this type of content, please be sure to check out rupauniversity.com to get access to all the previous sessions that we've done. So with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. James Lavelle. Dr. Lavelle is an internationally recognized clinical pharmacist, author, and board certified clinical nutritionist with over 35 years of clinical experience. Lavelle is best known for his expertise in performance health and integrative care with personally seeing thousands of clients over the years. He is the founder of Metabolic Code Enterprises and was voted National Clinician of the Year in 2012 by the Natural Products Association and was Educator of the Year in 2017 for A4M. So with that, thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to pass it over to you to uh, go through the presentation. Awesome. Let's hit it. Uh, you know, we got 45 minutes, so we're going to move it fast and hard. And I hope you learn something from this because I think it's incredibly important that you understand the value of um, food allergy testing and sensitivity testing and how it's core to understanding how you're going to regulate metabolic inflammation. And of course, that process associated with it known as inflammaging. So, you know, how do they occur? What to test for and why? That's what we're going to go through. You know, so the first one, you know, what's an allergy? Look, we're all here. We're healthcare professionals listening in on this. And of course, we see that you know, there's the obvious hypersensitivity reaction when people get, you know, they start to have a closed airway, they get hives, they get rashes. Um, so that's best known as IgE. And then, of course, there are food intolerance reactions or sensitivity reactions, which we're going to uh, also detail through the course of the talk. You know, you got about 15 million people that suffer from a true IgE food allergy in the U.S. or about 4% of adults. Although you see that increasing, right, with people having more and more gut permeability problems, you know, peptides and proteins or lectins from food that leach across that, but that, that gut barrier, uh, creating that potential for developing IgE mediated responses. Uh, you've got around 15 to 20% of people reporting IgG mediated food intolerances and, and, you know, probably what's popularized that the most over the recent years, of course, is gluten intolerance. But I know back even when I was, <clears throat> Josh, early in my career, late 1970s, uh, early 80s, um, we knew that when kids drank dairy that they would get sinus problems and ear infections. And so you'd counsel people, whether it was in the clinic at the, you know, the health clinic or whether, you know, it was behind the counter, you're telling people, hey, get off the dairy, see how your kid does. And they'd see a significant improvement, right? So in, in you know, a good portion of those folks. So I think that it's now we just have an awareness of IgG related responses, uh, as well as the subcategories of IgG4, C3BD, which we're going to go through uh, in a little bit. Obviously, sensitivities usually take longer to occur. That's why when you're doing food elimination, you're telling people when they reintroduce, do one every, you know, three to four days and see how you react because that length of time, you know, and, and typically what you're going to see, there will be more of things like bloating, you know, joint pain, irritable bowel, tiredness, uh, it could be eczema, which you might think of more as an IgE response, but it could be IgG, um, mood changes, uh, you know, headaches, weight gain, you know, any number of things can arise from that it can be self-assessed. Uh, and at the same time, and worth it's thought that up to 45% of the population actually have some sort of food allergy, food sensitivity. Makes sense to me because you got a large population of people who have been on multiple rounds of antibiotics, they're on PPIs, they're on other acid blocking medications. 
Now, and there's a lot of different medications that disrupt the microbiome. And, you know, so therefore, when you disrupt the microbiome and you create some issues with those epithelial cells in the intestine, you're going to end up with food sensitivities. Allergies, of course, more uh, immediate reaction can be severe and life threatening. So you don't want to self test for this. Uh, and uh, so it's get 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 to the, uh, you know, ER quickly or get your EpiPen. Right. Uh, and uh, Rarely that type of IgE response or true allergy is from more than, you know, one or maybe two foods. And of course, how does it begin? It begins when that, that epithelial cells start to get permeable, right? And we've all learned about gut permeability now. So an allergen can get through that epithelial lining and it hits the antigen presenting cell, which then creates you know, a Th2 activation. We increase inflammatory cytokines. That creates that IgE epitope that you see there. And with that IgE epitope on the mast cell, we then see the release of histamine and leukotrienes and cytokines, uh, which then create clinical symptoms. Uh, so, you know, our challenge, of course, is keeping that gut integrity intact. And of course, this can happen from the time you're a neonate, right? We've all seen the studies where when they gave probiotics uh, to women in their third trimester, they reduced the, 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 the likelihood likelihood of IgE sensitivity by as much as 40% in a child. Uh, so we, we know that from the time you're in your mother's womb uh, through life, you're being you know assaulted with certain immune challenges. And I know from the time I started doing this work in 1985 uh, to now, way more common to see, you know, eosinophilic esophagitis and, you know, in young children and and uh, way more food allergies and intolerances, right? So what our real challenge is, is, you know, not just identifying these, but then what do we do about it, right? And so when you think of allergy versus sensitivity, of course, you know, we wanted to find the four things that food allergy and sensitivity testing that infinite allergies does that, uh, you, know, you know, the categories that they're in. First is, of course, the IgE response, which is, of course, an antibody response that leads to a quick allergic reaction. Uh, can happen immediate or within one to three hours after ingesting a food or liquid. And of course, you know, I've listed all of the classic IgE symptoms, whether it's wheezing or your airway closing, even more important than wheezing. Um, you know, clearing of the throat, which I think people just, what I find people don't even realize they're having to clear their throat frequently. Uh, and, and then of course there's IgE. And of course the argument is, well, IgE just means what you've eaten you know, recently, but you know, when you really start to get very significant IgE responses, well, then that means it could contribute to a low grade inflammatory response. When you couple that with other issues that the individual may have, uh, it could create a cascade of chronic inflammation. Uh, it can drive some histaminic response uh, as well. Uh, it is less severe typically than an IgE reaction, but you wanna think beyond just IgG and IgE. We think of IgG4, many of you are familiar with IgG4 now. And of course, this is the complement to an IgE antibody response. So what IgG4 does is it's blocking the IgE epitope. Uh, and, but the one thing to keep in mind is that if you have elevated IgG4, that leads to a more chronic inflammatory response uh, and is associated with autoimmunity. Uh, it contributes to eosinophilic esophagitis, thyroid, ovarian, and prostate tissue issues, amongst others. I've got a slide that shows you later on all of the uh, conditions that are associated with IgG4. And then, of course, the C3 complement or the C3 B and D complements, which um, are tested for, that's the complement to the IgG sensitivity. So if there is any C3 B, D present, um, that will dramatically amplify the IgG reaction. Now, interestingly, in the SIRS population, chronic inflammatory response syndrome uh, situation, uh, or in even post-COVID, we see this upregulation of C3BD. So I think you're going to see more and more of your patients that test for their food allergies and sensitivities and they're going to show up with C3BD complement pathways because of other underlying conditions that have occurred. And of course, why is IgG4 so important? Uh, it, it really, it's inhibiting mast cell activation. Uh, it's inhibiting that more in serious IgE reaction. So 
the higher the IgG4, the more you start to worry about, well, are they going to end up with, you know, going into an anaphylaxis type reaction? And a lot of you have seen that, right? People say, oh yeah, I've had a mounting allergic response. And all of a sudden it was like they dropped off a waterfall, right? They had that food that that final time where they had full blown anaphylaxis. And a lot of that is, is because you've, you know, you've, you've exhausted the ability of IgG4 to protect you. So, you know, when you, when you think of this, you think of, um, you know, on the complement cascades, what you're thinking of is if it's present, you should think of, you know, to what extent do I need to, you know, cause elimination with mild levels, you know, you see, with IgG4, it has a protective effect. With very high levels of IgG4, it relates to those autoimmune disease pathways getting activated. Uh, and of course, uh, when you look at this, you know, you're, what you're looking at is trying to find out, well, which foods do I really need to intervene on? And I'll be answering questions at the end, guys. I'm going to keep moving. So if you want to load up in the chat or in the Q&A, that's fine. So conditions that are associated with IgG4, I've just listed a few of them, but I've got a really nice detailed slide that shows, you know, all the different studies that have shown IgG4 relationships to different uh, conditions. Uh, but this is just kind of a short but brief summary when you look at, you know, IgG4 lung-related disease, pharyngitis, pancreatitis, prostatitis, um, thyroid disease, right? And then, you know, that once again, it's the extent that you're looking at. So IgG4 is helping you to understand how extensive is the experience that individual's having. So you're, you're wanting to really find out, you know, are they pushing towards IgE? How much protection is actually being afforded at the current time so that you, you know, can get a clear picture of what's going on? And, you know, when you look at C3BD, the big thing, you want to understand on C3BD is that it gives a, a very high likelihood of a much stronger inflammatory response. So when C3BD is present, you have a, a, a much better overall picture of that complement activation. But more importantly, those are really foods you have to focus on to get out of that individual's diet. And I would say as long as, as well as IgG4, uh, really important. And so when you look at C3BD, you know, really what's happening is you're getting a danger signal uh, that's being uh, categorized through your soluble immune sensors, which ends up triggering this C3B activation. So if you look to the bottom here, as I either have an, a, you know, some sort of microbe that's activating it or a protein or a lectin or something that's activating it or a phenolic compound for that matter, um, we, we lead to this C3 process that creates the C3B and C3D activation. And you know, the reason I put this slide in is this came right out of the differential diagnosis of food intolerance. If you look, you have these type two reactions, which are, you know, your C3A, C5A complements are basically looking at the C3 complements that are more of the delayed sensitivity reactions, right? Which is what IgG is related to, correct? So the C3BD is falling in this category of not IgE, but in this delayed sensitivity reaction. And this is what a report looks like. I just wanted to get this out of the way to begin with. So when you look at the report, it's, I think it's easy for the, for the patient to understand, uh, first of all, you know, what's reacting, how reactive is this, right? Uh, and, and then what do I really need to focus on? So you get a, a you know, pretty complete list of the level of reactivity that's taking place in the individual and it's a you know pretty distilled down in a few pages, so it makes it simple for them to to be able to review. And you'll get two different paths of what you should avoid. Uh, the mild restriction, I would say that's for people that hey, I've heard about food allergies. Gee, I may have a weight issue. Um, not necessarily they have a condition. 
uh, the more they have a condition like autoimmune thyroiditis, for example, the more I push towards severe restriction for the individuals, meaning that you're going to get out all the reactive foods and try to really calm down that immunologic response. Now, that being said, there's other aspects to say autoimmune thyroiditis that you're going to include, for example, the presence of lipopolysaccharide or circulating endotoxin, right, which is the breakdown of your gut microbiome and the inability to regulate lipopolysaccharide. Uh, so that's another facet of this. But the bottom line is, is this is showing us, well, what foods are you um, going to restrict? And do you want to pick a more mild restriction or a more severe restriction? So when we get to what causes, you know, food allergies and, you know, the, the first step, it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, it's, you know, as our gut starts to break down and we lose our tight junction capacity, we allow for foods uh, and bacteria uh, to be able to cross that blood brain that, or that, that epithelial barrier, right? Uh, and that epithelial barrier then allows for that presentation to antigen presenting cells, which then begins to create uh, food sensitivity reactions. And of course, the leakier we get and the more permeable we get, the more problematic this can become. And this is just, you know, a picture showing that, you know, yeah, gut permeability is very real. This was uh, electron microscopy. Uh, if you look at the title of this, uh, uh, and it came out of this uh, study, it was in the microbiota dysbiosis and barrier dysfunction and inflammatory bowel disease and colorectal cancers, uh, exploring the common ground hypothesis. If you look over here at A, a healthy epithelial barrier. If you look over here at C, we see these cracks and crevices in a disrupted micro, uh, you know, epithelial barrier. And then if you look at the, the, the tight junction gaps and the cilia, we see very nice tight junction brush border and healthy brush border cells, nice tight junction. When we look here, we see a disordered brush border and a disruption in, the, in, that, in that tight junction barrier, right? So this... Well, the more we get to being like this C and D, the more we, we begin to see these problems associated with food allergies and sensitivities. And of course, I, I mentioned things like COVID, gut microbiome alterations and gut barrier dysfunction associated with host immune homeostasis in COVID-19 patients. So it's basically, we, we, you know, we found out that you know, in our COVID population that part of the issue was that you know, they got disrupted gut barrier uh, function. And I think that's one of the things that we're going to see with both the long haulers and other complications that are going to occur in the future. You're going to see more and more people uh, over the coming years, I think, that you know, may have more sensitivity issues. And yet, that, once again, neuropathy and, and that COVID-19 associated with dysbiosis-related inflammation, meaning that the gut microbiota get disturbed, we're no longer making short-chain fatty acids, we're not repairing the epithelial cells, we're now creating a more systemic inflammatory immune response or characterized here with generalized immune dysfunction and inflammation. And so, you know, when you really think about this, because uh, I want I do want to kind of paint the picture of why are all these things happening? It, it's all about metabolic signaling. So, you know, your metabolism is more than calories in and calories out. Your metabolism is about the process of controlling metaflammation signaling or metabolic inflammation. And the reason I'm bringing this up is that, you know, people have to eat food every day. They don't have to take a supplement every day. They don't have to exercise every day or overtrain. They don't necessarily have to be exposed to environmental burden. They may not be on antibiotics, but the one thing that's for sure, people eat every day. And if they're sensitive or allergic to foods, that's going to drive metaflammation signaling, which of course leads to things like inflammation, uh, e even if it's not leading to a condition currently, right? I may not be feeling the effect of this sensitivity to almonds today, but I keep drinking almond milk and I keep eating almond yogurt and I keep eating almond cheese and my gut barrier is sensitive and I've triggered a response to, to this. Uh, it's looking at the future. And so understanding those disruptors of, of metabolic performance leads to how you can you know, have a strategy. And I think food allergy and sensitivity testing is one of the best things that you can do uh, to help people because once again, people have to eat every day.
And, you know, what are the things that are involved in this immune, this immune dysregulation in the gut? Medications are a big one. I've got a few slides, I think, to show that. And it's not just antibiotics. It's not just corticosteroids. It's not just, uh, you know, pro proton pump inhibitors. Uh, it's the fact that, you know, metformin can cause a disruption in the epithelium. Uh, that, you know, obviously stress, which I'll go through in a bit, diet. I know we all think there's one diet that everybody needs, but the reality is, probably varies based on an individual to a extent. Certainly people need to eat more plant food, but the, at the other aspect of it, it's, you know, food selection can make a, you know, a big difference on what's going on with gut immune dysregulation. Uh, you can overtrain and get a leaky gut. Uh, we, I see it all the time. I work with athletes on all five, you know, professional sports and gut issues are there commonly. And then of course there can be environmental triggers. So things like, um, you know, exercise and training regimens, for example, uh, you know, environmental and chemical triggers, you know, we like these, these environmental triggers like glyphosate, that can be a big, you know, big, big issue. And, you know, here are all the key tenants that affect us. And guess what? The key tenants of all this also affect the gut, which means it's going to affect the propensity for food allergies. So whether it's oxidative stress or chronic inflammation signaling, imbalances in hormones, stress hormones, glucose and insulin regulation, of course, because we trigger more inflammation, the higher, the more insulin resistant we become. Uh, and obviously at the core of it, our integrity of our gut, where's our immune system at? What it's, what's it being driven by? Uh, what's our environmental burden? And of course there's individuality. You know, some people are robust, some people are fragile, and there's a lot of people in between. The first area I want to talk about is this whole aspect of stress and understanding that stress response is incredibly important. Uh, and we talk about allostatic load, right? So allostasis is the ability to cope with environmental stressors, the ability to cope with, you know, where my, you know, whether it's physical stress or psychogenic stress. But then there's individuality, right? There's genes, there's development, it's your life experience, trauma, all these types of things can trigger behavioral changes which can lead to this kind of from allostasis to uh, wear and tear, otherwise known as allostatic load. And allostatic load basically changes the way your brain communicates with the rest of your body. Why is that important? Well, we have something called an enteric nervous system. So the brain connects to the gut and, the, and that signaling of the gut brain interface is pretty crucial in terms of, you know, evolving health for individuals. And so when you think of, you know, how does stress affect us? Well, it affects gut motility, it affects the gut microbiota, it affects blood flow um, to the gut, which means bacteria can die off, creating more lipopolysaccharide. Um, it can affect the paracellular permeability. If you're under chronic stress and you upregulate interleukin-6, uh, that's going to send a signal for that epithelial cell to trigger more clodin-2, and that clodin-2 will uh, activate the loosening of the tight junctions or the breakdown of tight junctions. So when you're stressed out, uh, it absolutely can affect tight junction permeability. And this is just a very nice circuit board. Uh, that I've used for years to explain this. So when you see yourself as being under stress, it could be, like I said, psychogenic, physical, it could be nutrient imbalances, or it could be a lot of things that trigger this. Uh, the HPA axis gets activated. There's a very direct line to stress response, right? Hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, increased cortisol output. Cortisol output increases permeability. I think I'm going to turn off my camera here because I think I'm freezing. Uh, and then, we, you know, the other method that occurs is you get this upregulation of sympathetic output via the spinal cord signaling, which then triggers the enter enterochromophobin cells to upregulate peripheral corticotropin releasing hormone. That's over here. And of course, this triggers permeability. It also upregulates mast cells, which end up signaling an increase in permeability. The net effect on on the gut is that we get enhanced antigen presentation. We trigger inflammation and immune activation potentially to these foods. And of course, this becomes a vicious cycle of chronic inflammatory signaling now upregulating the hypothalamus. So if we had to kind of create a, a summary of 
you know, what causes problems? Poor inflammatory dietary choices, stress and emotions, infections, lectins, systemic disease, low stomach acid, toxin exposure, all leading to this altered intestinal permeability, which then leads to food allergies and sensitivities, reduced absorption, malnutrition, changes in, in the flora. We start to see um, both metabolic intermediate overload or toxin overload, which then starts to create this whole aspect of toxin and antigen burden leading to systemic disease. And, you know, when you think of it, this is the relationship, right? You've got the brain, which is in, in charge of, you know, cognition and memory and mood and emotions, and then is a central controller of physiology. And then, of course, there's that gut, which has single epithelial layer with initial metabolism and biotransformation of all chemicals, and as well as a structural defense, right, against our, you know, our bloodstream. And then, of course, there's the innate immune system and acquired immune system. And then, of course, that's involved in our repair cycle. And it's involved in cell to cell communication as to whether or not we're under an inflammatory response or whether we're able to turn off that inflammatory response and return to homeostasis. That's the basis of metaflammation. When I can no longer return to homeostasis, I get into a chronic meta inflammatory cycle, which leads on everything from, um, you know, lipid disturbances to alterations in ferritin uh, storage to insulin receptor signaling changes where you go to more a um, aerobic glycolysis, which is you know inefficient versus oxfos. All of these things start to cascade down as we're triggering that chronic metabolic inflammatory signaling, which food can be in the middle of. And of course, what do we see? We can see intraepithelial accumulation, upregulation of antigen presenting cells, uh, and this whole process of gut dysbiosis and intestinal permeability changes. As we start to look at this and we progress under stress, we can see changes in cortisol patterns or the diurnal pattern of cortisol. We see elevations of beta-2 microglobulin, which leads to a leaky blood-brain barrier, alterations in melanocyte stimulating hormone, which of course runs the melanocortin system. We, see, we start to see changes in you know, neurotransmitters, whether or not they've got and, you know, gene SNPs that might alter that. And then, of course, when we look at the gut, we start to see things you know, such as you know, ALT, AST, and bilirubin changes, you know, downregulation of you know, diamond oxidase, upregulation of histamine, initial upregulation of VEGF. Of course, when you get into the chronic inflammatory response syndrome cases or the SIRS cases, uh, we see a, a, a depression in VEGF. And then, of course, when we look at the immune system, we begin to see, you know, changes in inflammatory response. Uh, so ESR, CRP, interleukins, TNF-alpha, TGF-beta-1, uh, VEGF, C3A, C4A, food allergies, and I would say IgG, IgG4, C3BD. And then, of course, uh, you know, the potential for looking at measurable toxins or viruses or other biotoxins for the individual. So... You know, when we have excessive epithelial lymphocyte expression, that damages our tight junctions. So as we're starting to see more and more expression of this immunologic change, we also further that damage. Uh, this was a, you know, a great uh, paper, Aspects of Gut Microbiota and the Immune System Interactions in Infectious Disease, Immunopathology, and Cancer. And this was in Frontiers of Immunology back in 2018. And of course, you know, what, what we're really uh, looking for is as we continue to drive uh, lymphocyte activation, uh, it could indicate things, uh, you know, the most basic things like intolerances to, to gluten or, or gliadin but a host of other um, food intolerances as well. And of course, even inhaled allergens will trigger this response in the gut. Uh, and then of course, if friendly flora are depleted, that response gets heightened. And of course, we start to trigger this TH2 activation. And, and really this is more, when we, we begin to look at these HLA uh, haplotypes that we see uh, that are more, I would say, uh, at risk uh, on environmental exposures, um, basically what we're seeing is that this HLA class, uh, if you are, especially if your gene SNPs are positive, can heighten this response. And this is what we're really trying to balance out, right? We're trying to balance out the fact that, 
you know, we need both sides of the immune system and we do not need uh, one side, you know, dominating the other. A good example of this is when we had this chronic inflammatory response that occurred over the pandemic. Of course, now we're all talking about the issue of T-cell senescence or T-cell exhaustion that's occurring because we wear out that aspect of our immune system um, basically being overrun by an inflammatory cascade or a cytokine storm. And then I mentioned that, you know, there are a lot of different drugs that deplete the issue that, you know, or, or can change the microbiome. I thought this was fascinating. We're actually doing a database on this right now. So, you know, it's, it's more than just antibiotics and NSAIDs and PPIs and H2 blockers, you know, metformin, statins, antipsychotics, opioids. There's, it's an estimate that maybe 24% of the drugs that, that uh, are taken in on a daily basis are disrupting the microbiome potentially, which means you have more risk. And of course, you know, when we start to, you know, grow more yeast and create more candida, create more mycotoxins from candida metabolism, it tends to damage the intestinal cells and interfere with their thyroid hormones uh, and interfere with me metabolic function. And of course, we start to create more acetaldehyde, which is going to be more important in the future. But just so you realize that as we upregulate acetaldehyde, we, it can travel uh, in the bloodstream it can, and it can, can accumulate in brain, spinal cord, muscle tissue, liver. More importantly, acetaldehyde, if you upregulate acetaldehyde, you have to break it down, acetaldehyde oxidase. When you run out of acetaldehyde, you're no longer able to metabolize histamine completely. And so, you know, some of the side effects, obviously, when you're, when you're upregulating acetaldehyde is that, you know, serotonin. Uh, you know, is now transformed into beta carboline. Uh, you can make salsolinol, another phenolic compound, when you have it reacting with dopamine. So the issue becomes here uh, that understanding once again that you know we're in a male you in this uh, inflammatory, broken down epithelial process where we've got bugs that are growing that, that normally don't belong there or don't belong there in any excessive amount. Uh, and it starts to physically change the chemistry uh, of our neurochemicals and, 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 and other chemicals that are important for homeostasis. And, you know, th and once again, this is just more of the same. So I'm not going to belabor this fact anymore. And of course, when we get under stress, so when we look at this, the, the, the net of that is that as, as we uh, break down our gut lining or we lose blood flow into the gut, we produce more lipopolysaccharide. Of course, that being a, you know, a significant trigger, uh, for, <coughs> excuse me, for chronic inflammatory conditions globally, right? So lipopolysaccharide attaches to the heart, attaches to the kidneys, it attaches to the thyroid and triggers inflammatory chemistry. And, you know, that this is kind of just a global list of where food allergies and sensitivities could play a role. Now, this is a study, uh, you know, autoimmunity 2018, uh, 100 patients diagnosed with autoimmune disorders and high levels of autoimmune anti-nuclear antibodies compared to 25 controls. Uh, if you, in this particular study, it showed that the IgG levels were significantly higher in autoimmune patients. I know most of us realize this at this point. We, we put people on, you know, elimination diets for their autoimmunity. Uh, and in many cases, they just start feeling better even from that. And of course, an irritable bowel disease, about 80% of irritable bowel uh, syndrome patients report they're triggered by a specific food, um, you know, gluten, most prevalent, um, you know, dairy, most prevalent. Uh, and it also creates malabsorption issues. And then even with mood disorders, um, depression is, is also linked to specific IgG mediated sensitivity. So why test for all four categories? It's because all four of them are probably playing a role to some extent or another. And this is just more of the same. Um, and I just put these in because I think it's important that, you know, these publications have been around for a while. If you look at the, oh, I don't know, the studies 15 years ago, you would probably see more naysayers related to that versus um, today where more and more evidence is coming out on these subclasses and their effect on specific conditions. So when you look here, 
12 year observational study on 499 patients with systemic lupus. Uh, so patients with active disease at a 27% higher level of IgG antibodies. This is a 2019 study on patients with cardiovascular disease having more frequent intolerances to banana, dairy, and eggs, which I was like, wow, banana, really? But interesting, you know, Journal of Food and Nutrition Research showing the, the correlation. 2007 study here showing that interval medial thickness in obese juveniles was positively correlated to their IgG food antibodies. So that thought that, oh, well, IgG just means that they're reacting to foods they've eaten, right? And that means they're triggering an inflammatory response that is probably affecting their glycans, right? Which, you know, you have, you know, your all cells have glycans in them. And more, and you know, as you start to trigger more inflammatory processes, you create more pro-inflammatory glycans as well. So in this particular study, it showed there was an associated risk on eight IgG antibodies uh, and intimal medial thickness and increased risk of atherosclerosis. Uh, so, you know, once again, important to note that. So why should you think about testing for food allergies on an annual basis? I think it's because we should be doing everything we can. You know, put all these, these bullet points aside, guys. What I do in my practice, you know, still today, 38 years later, is I'm looking for all the things that could be contributing to metaformation. What is contributing to that metabolic global inflammatory signaling? People eat food every day. They need to, to realize that with this um, the food ingestion can come inflammatory signaling that can be silent for quite a while, but eventually it rears its ugly head. And, you know, so what do you do? You test for IgE, IgG4, IgG, and test for the complement to IgG. Uh, and, you know, 20% of the population has IgG food intolerance or sensitivity as reported. Uh, the microbiome changes not only with age, but with all the different medications that can occur in individuals, uh, stress, environmental burden, all of these things are incredibly important uh, in terms of microbiotic composition and, of course, the immunologic drive that occurs from that. Uh, and when we look at zonulin, uh, testing for zonulin, uh, also very important. Uh, so, you know, why are we worrying about zonulin so much? Because look, when we test for zonulin, the higher the zonulin, the more it's related to, to leaky gut. And remember, whether it's a bug or it's stress, when you upregulate IL-6 or inflammatory signaling, it will trigger the breakdown of those tight junctions. And of course, gliadin being a big one, I'm not going to go into this too much um, because we realize that you can either be, you know, celiac, but you could also have, you know, simple gluten intolerance that can lead to extended permeability changes that occur in an individual for several hours after ingesting, you know, a gluten containing grain. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. So when you think of stable gut microbiota, those tight junctions are allowing for controlled antigen trafficking. And when we have gut dysbiosis and mesonulin is broken down, we get excessive antigen trafficking, we trigger more cytokine response, it triggers more inflammation, we get more T cell activation and we get loss of immune tolerance. And here is this, that, that study associated with increased zonulin. So when you look at this, these are all the diseases that have been associated with increased zonulin. So why test for zonulin? Well, these are a lot of the most common things we're dealing with all the time. You know, insulin resistance, hyperlipidemia, irritable bowel, colitis, right? You know, these are, you know, attention deficit, right? Um, so, you know, to me, very interesting because we really need, how do we know when we're getting traction on people, when we're tightening up those tight junctions? We're seeing a reduction in their food intolerances and their and their allergies and sensitivities, uh, and then of course, you know it's highly indicative of a leaky gut when zonulin levels are high, and then of course zonulin is being linked to obesity and hypertension and impaired fasting glucose and metabolic syndrome. Uh, makes sense because as I trigger inflammatory signaling or that loss of immune tolerance, by default my insulin receptors are going to become more resistant to insulin signaling because they're it's driven by you know inflammatory cytokines 
So, you know, obviously things like, you know, nutritional support, whether you're using things like glutamine, uh, zinc carnosine, berberine, very good for the tight junctions, making sure that your, you know, probiotics are present. I would say even more importantly, if people are under chronic stress, you got to give them things for chronic stress. So whether that's theanine or relora or holy basil or, you know, uh, in an acetal, right? Things that get people to feel less stressed, work on their vagal tone, make them do deep breathing, get them out of fight or flight, incredibly important for healing the gut. And then the one last piece I want to cover, because I got about three minutes and I want to, want to stay right on time for us, is that, of course, histamine uh, is incredibly important because histamine lives in this balance with the enzyme diamond oxidase. And of course, we all are hearing now about, you know, mastocytosis. Well, now we're figuring out that in people, you know, with, you know, SIRS, for example, that they're turning on their histamine genes in every cell and they're becoming an elegant histamine generator. So it's just important to realize that accumulated histamine, of course, we're seeing it more and more commonly, more and more people with thermographia, and chronic skin wheels and allergies and, and uh, just realizing that it is in a balance with the ability to break that histamine down. And of course, high histamine foods, I'm sure you're familiar uh, with these and you're gonna get these slides so you can get this. I think it's important to look at this slide. So when you look at histamine, if you look down here at the bottom, you see this aldehyde dehydrogenase, this is what gets used up. If say you have a lot of chronic candida, uh, and you're making a lot of acid aldehyde, you break down your ability to finish histamine metabolism. So, you know, that's why it's so important to understand that, that importance of regulating the gut in terms of the microflora. And, you know, so, you know, test for DAO, test for histamine, look at, you know, histamine and zonulin in addition to looking at your food allergy and sensitivity testing, infinite allergy, um, you know, testing allows for doing that. And, you know, I just kind of gave, you know, these are urinary histamine, you can do serum histamine, you can do urinary histamine. And of course, why is histamine so important? If you look at it, it has far reaching issues. So, you know, when you've got a, a, a high gut permeability and you're triggering IgE and you're triggering IgG4 and people are loading on those, that histaminic response because the enteric nervous system is hyper aroused. Histamine relates to dysmenorrhea. It relates to stomach aches. It relates to diarrhea. It relates to, to circadian rhythm and hyper arousal of the brain. I've had plenty of people where I've downregulated their hips. Why antihistamines work for as a sleep aid, right? That's what most people buy when they walk in a pharmacy. It can be, it can create headaches. It can create hypotension. It can create arrhythmias, the obvious issues around the skin. So all of these issues are important. Uh, and, uh, you know, with that, that's why we want to make sure that we understand how do we start to look at histamine, zonulin, and food allergy sensitivity as the way that we're regulating the never ending march that most people in our culture have towards metabolic inflammation and inflammatory aging. Obviously, here's some foods that also block the DO enzyme. You can give DO enzymes to help people, but obviously, you want to try and help them to start to produce them. And, uh, you know, I gave a list here of some things that can support histamine symptoms. Obviously, uh, you know, zinc and vitamin C, uh, magnesium can be of help. Obviously, quercetin, one of the most obvious where you can do, you know, quercetin to shut down that, that leukotriene response uh, or just the vitamin C flush, right? But uh, once again, I left these for you so that you can kind of look at those. And, uh, you know, and basically, guys, that is uh, the presentation. I'm going to uh, take a look here at our chat. Yeah, first and foremost, thank you so much for that. Um, that was an amazing presentation. We did get some awesome questions in. Um, and yeah, actually, I lost internet connection about halfway through that. And so unfortunately, with Zoom, when you hop out and hop back in, you lose all previous conversations. So there were a few questions uh, that came in before 1129 that if you could read those and have access to those, that would be great. 
Sure. Okay. The ones that I have, so I've got on the chat, which, which lab do you use? Well, obviously I use infinite food allergy testing. So infinite allergy labs regarding yes. COVID, if gold is compromised, can we assume that Bolt is also compromised leading to increased susceptibility to infection? Uh, the quick answer to that would be yes. Uh, and are you doing anything different as far as supplements go in the presence of long haul COVID? What about SPMs? So yeah, long haul COVID, I mean, unrelated to, you know, testing for their gut and correcting your gut because you need to, uh, SPMs are great because you're increasing resolvins, which is going to decrease inflammasome activity, especially in LRP3, uh, in the brain. Um, but I would also say I use something called RG3 or synapsin uh, lipotabs or synapsin nasal spray because uh, it down regulates microglial activation. And then, of course, the last piece is, is I'll use peptides at times like MOT SC, which it upregulates the mitochondria and restores mitochondrial efficiency in these COVID long haulers, as well as um, some people are using IV, uh, NADH. I'm using uh, sub Q and using things like Truniagen to help upregulate that mitochondrial capacity. So you have to focus on mitochondrial capacity, down regulating microglial activation, uh, as well as correcting the gut. So those are those three that were in the chat. Oh, there were more in the chat. Uh oh. Yeah, uh, there's a few in the chat. There's also that QA button as yeah, well. The QA coming up now. We're rolling. Perfect. Is IgG4 affected by other IgG responses? So IgG4 actually gets more upregulated in order to protect against IgE. Um, would you please elaborate what you mean that IgG4 complements IgE? IgG4 is upregulated in response to protecting against IgE. So if you think of it, it's the complement reaction that's protecting against IgE. Will we get these slides? Obviously, how would pelvic radiation affect the barrier of the gut and how would one fix it? Well, I mean, pelvic radiation affects the microflora for sure. So you would want to replace with the microbiota. You would probably want to do things like zinc carnosine, aloe, uh, glutamine, um, marshmallow to help build up that mucosal barrier. Uh, and, uh, and that, that'd probably be the big ones is, you know, and, and if you suspect that they've got dysbiosis, which most of the time they do, they've probably got a coated tongue. They probably have a broken down tongue or geographic tongue, in which case you would want to act on that with using maybe things like berberine, cat's claw, grape, grapefruit seed extract, you know, things that kill bad bugs. You may want to do a, 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 you know, maybe like a, you know, a, a stool test to kind of figure that one out. Um, what is the benefit of only measuring IgG4 rather than IgG that includes all four subclasses? Um, the benefit is that you're looking at their global response to see which foods they're most severely reactive to. And uh, we did the, does pelvic radiation destroy the gut lining? Is so how can it be resolved? Does glutamine help? I already answered that. When zonulin is measured, what's being tested, the levels are antibodies to zonulin. Depends on what test you're looking at. You can get zonulin levels or you can get zonulin antibodies. And um, can it fluctuate? Typically in individuals that are chronically stressed, for example, their zonulin is typically chronically uh, elevated because of the persistent signaling of uh, Clodin 2 via the IL-6 pathway. So that typically would be the issue there. So I think I got, uh, I think I got them all. Yeah, two more coming in the chat. So we'll, we'll finish on these two. Oh, okay, and then, let's go. Uh, rapid fire, I love it. Uh, what about uh, parasites and food allergies with gut function? Well, I mean, look, when you have parasites, you're upregulating your immunologic drive. So that's why you got to do a fecal test and you got to find out what's going on. So, you know, yes, could parasites be causal to developing food allergies? 100%, just like Candida could just like Citrobacter could, you know, just like any bad bug that's disrupting the flora will trigger that. Uh, and anything else here? Do you have recommendations oh, for post-colonoscopy to rebuild the biome? Oh, do you recommend for post-colonoscopy? I mean, look, look, I've been using probiotics for 38 years now, and I know we all want to do customized probiotics, but look, guys, just get a human strain flora that is proven to be live till the date of expiration and proven that all the multiple 
bugs are in that capsule to the date of expiration because we're getting people putting 35 different bugs that are competing with each other and you're really not getting all those bugs. Also, I suggest a room temperature stable probiotic. When you're using refrigerated probiotics, when you open them in the external environment of the refrigerator and you open the bottle, the humidity and change in air temperature actually affects those probiotics. So I'm really big on room temperature stable probiotics have proven efficacy uh, to the date of expiration. Beautiful. Dr. Right. James Lavelle, the man, the myth, the legend. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. That was an amazing presentation. Um, any final thoughts or words that you want to get out to the folks? Hey, look, it's like I said, you know, all of us get pretty avant-garde on how we test and all the kind of, you know, the, the things we're looking for. The one thing that you have to, you have to account for what is the immune reactivity of foods in an individual if you're really going to gain control on their chronic metabolic inflammatory signaling? And of course, all the downstream conditions and symptoms that people experience, you have to test for foods. Yep. Love it. Well, thank you so much again for joining us this afternoon. Um, for those of you who are able to stick around, um, we are going to show you right now how to order the tests from Infinite Allergy Labs that were spoken about during today's presentation directly from Rupa Health. So Dr. Lavelle, you're welcome to hop off. I'm going to jump on and uh, do a quick screen share here. Wow. Back to the folks. So first and foremost, y'all, we appreciate you so much for sticking around and, and joining us during this presentation. It's a very important topic, which is why we here at Rupa Health host these conversations on a weekly basis. Um, today's co topic was, was an amazing one that we partnered with Infinite Allergy Labs on. Um, and so what I want to talk to you just briefly about for the next 10 minutes or so is Rupa Health and who we are, what we do, why do we do what we do. So if you're new to joining one of these presentations, Rupa Health is a platform that's designed to make it easier when it comes to all things lab testing. Um, and, and the way that I like to explain it is there's three different buckets, right? There's the practitioner side. Most practitioners who are ordering these tests work with anywhere from three to 10 different labs at any given time, right? Because you have your food allergy tests, your gut tests, your hair tests, your stool tests, you name it, right? Uh, and so traditionally, you have to go to each individual portal to place all your orders, to manage all your results, right? And that within itself can be a pain. Then the next bucket that you'll think about is the patient experience, right? When you're sending these tests to your patients, one, they can be expensive. So how are your patients first and foremost paying for these expensive tests? Two, what's the patient experience look like overall, right? Who's managing all the patient support? Who's managing all of the questions that they have? Who's managing all the specimen issues, right? And so what we've done is we've created here an end-to-end -end patient experience. So now you can not only place all your orders for your tests in one place, but you can also track and manage the results and have the patient experience handled end-to-end. -end. The final thing that I want to talk about real quick is just the educational component to it. You all here are a part of the educational pillar of Rupa Health, Rupa University. We host these live classes on a weekly basis where you're able to join live and for free to learn about the tests that are offered here at Rupa Health because there is so much information out there within functional medicine, whether you've been a practitioner for 20 years or for 20 months, there's still and always going to be more to learn. So what we do is we create content just like these live classes for free, as well as paid content like boot camps, where you can come as a practitioner to continue to learn. How does it all work? Let's take a look, right? So first and foremost, I'm going to show you how easy it is to order tests from Rupa Health. So what you're seeing here is the Rupa Health platform. The first thing I'm going to show you is where it says start an order. To start an order on Rupa, it's as simple as typing in the patient's first name, last name, and email address. We collect everything else directly from the patient to place that order. That way, you don't need to have all the patient's information on hand, just their first name, last name, email address. We collect everything else directly from the patient. What you're seeing here is the order screen. The order screen is broken down into three different categories, or rather uh, sections. Up at the top here, you can have custom bundles. A custom bundle is a set of tests, a set of blood panels, a combination of blood panels and tests from any one of the labs that we work with. That way it's just one click and any test can be added into your cart straight away. Below that, you have a favorites list. So a favorites list is just common tests that you're ordering, individual tests, you put a little heart next to it. And that way, again, it just appears at the very top of your test or at the end or top of your order screen. So that way I can order that 88 food antigen from Infinite Allergy Labs. And let's say I wanna order that 88 food antigen with IgE and Ig4 um, instead. And I can also order a GI map from Diagnostic Solutions. 
right? I can do that in two clicks here at Rupa Health. And if that's it, I can click send a patient. And that's how easy it is to order tests for Rupa Health. If you are looking for a specific test that's within our catalog, you have access to it down below here. But there's also some cool little customizations that we can do, right? By that, I mean, we can schedule tests out in advance. So if you want to schedule an order for a patient, you know, six months down the line to retest them, you can schedule it out and automate that process. Our kits will drop ship directly to the patient. So no longer will you have to stock any uh, kits in office. Um, and then pricing. How does our pricing work? Well, we offer wholesale practitioner prices. So that means the same prices that you're getting going directly with the labs are the same prices that we offer here at Rupa Health, right? So the cost is the exact same. And I'm sure you're curious, hey, how does Rupa generate your revenue? It's simple. We offer, or rather, we charge a 7% processing and ordering fee on each order. And that's paid for by whoever's paying for the tests. So we offer either us billing the patient directly, meaning that we'll offload the billing off your shoulders onto ours, or you have the option of paying for the tests. Whether you're paying or the patient's paying, the price is the exact same. But if you're having us bill the patient directly, what that means is Rupa is free for you to use. Simple as that. Now, what's really cool is with Infinite Allergy, we can actually do Medicare as well. So if your PCOS enrolled with Infinite Allergy Labs, we can do Medicare for your patients. So something that's really unique. From there, you can add notes for the patient, you can add notes for Rupa, and you can even add ICD-10 codes. So with Rupa, just to call out, we don't accept insurance directly, but if you are interested in adding ICD codes to an order, we'll walk your patient through the process on how to create a super bill to submit to insurance for potential reimbursement. So again, just another thing that we can do to assist your patients to get the best possible experience. And with that, you just go ahead and click send a patient. And I'll walk you through what the patient experience looks like in a moment. But what I want to first show you is just how you're tracking and managing all these orders, right? So with that, I sent the order to my patient. How am I tracking that? Well, you do that right here in the main dashboard. In this dashboard, I can search by patient. I can filter by status of my order, or I can just even click and do an existing order, right? So here's an order that I sent out. I can click in. I can see that here's four different tests um, from four different labs that I sent out right? I can track and manage the status of all of my different orders, right? So I can see when the sample arrived at the lab, when I can expect the results to be in, and we'll alert you as those results come in. And from there, you can download the results. You can send the results directly to the patient through a HIPAA compliant link. You can schedule a clinical consultation with the lab. So should you need some additional assistance interpreting those results, that's available for you here. And then from there, if there is a digital requisition, you can do that requisition straight away. But again, the idea here is to give you one single form of communication to track and manage all of your orders and your results without having to go to each individual portal to do so. So what does it look like on the patient side of things, right? How do we make the patient experience better? Let me show you what that looks like. So as soon as you send that order to the patient, this is what the timeline looks like. Your patient will receive an email from us. We'll notify the patient once the order has been shipped. We'll send over instructions, FAQs, oftentimes videos on how to complete the test, walk them through how to fill out the requisition form, as well as even coordinate phlebotomy if there's a blood draw required. From there, we'll follow up with the patient to answer any questions that they have, and then you are notified as the results come in. And here's what it looks like. Here's the communications that are sent to the patient if they are the ones paying for the order, right? So as I mentioned, we'll collect pay payment directly from the patient, just offloading another thing off your shoulders, offering them that wholesale practitioner price. Hi, Joshua, Dr. Jordan has ordered these tests for you. We'll introduce who we are. And then one very important thing to call out here is that we accept not only cash or credit for these tests, but we can accept HSA, we can accept FSA, and we can even set up a three month interest-free payment plan with the patients. So. The payment plan is amazing. Um, it's one of the ways that we are lowering and helping our patients get access to these oftentimes very expensive tests. From there, we'll collect all the necessary information to complete the order, first name, last name, or excuse me, uh, shipping information, billing information, and of course, demographic information. From there, we'll highlight the test that was ordered over here on the right-hand side. But if you as a practitioner decide to pay for the order, Nothing changes in terms of the patient experience. The only difference is since you're the one paying for the tests, we're not gonna show the patient the cost of those tests, right? So that's the option for you if you do wanna add on any additional interpretation fees or things like that, this would be the best option for you. 
from there. Like I said, we'll notify the patient once the order has been shipped out, and then we'll send over an email that looks very similar to this. So we'll walk the patient through how to complete the tests with instructions and FAQs, like I said, oftentimes videos. We'll walk them through how to fill out the requisition form. And if there is a blood draw required, we can either customize that information based on your recommendation. So if you yourself can draw blood in office, we can tell the patient to come see you or we'll send over options based on the lab that they're working with. Each blood lab having their own network of phlebotomists, we'll send those options to the patient, but let's say the patient wants something different. Maybe they want a mobile phlebotomist to come draw their blood at home. We'll send over those options. They can just reach out to us and our team and we'll search by zip code within our own directory to send over potential options. Additionally, just in general, if the patient has any questions in regards to the test, we will manage the entire support aspect of their testing experience. Um, of course, if it's anything medical related, we'll send them back your way. But we'll even manage any specific issues. You'll of course be alerted, um, but you won't have to do anything. So we'll coordinate all the retesting directly with the lab and the patients. From there, we'll follow up with the patient. And then you're notified as the results come in. So as I showed you before, we're notifying you as each individual result comes in. We're not waiting for the entirety of all three tests or however many tests you're ordering. You're notified as each individual test comes in. So you can plan accordingly with your patient on how you want to follow up with next steps. Um, with that, our compliance rates are above 85%. And so we want to provide just the best possible experience for everybody involved. Now, last thing I want to show you here is just Rupa University. So I'm going to go to rupertuniversity.com. So what we've seen so far, the first two pillars, the patient experience, the practitioner experience. Now I just want to walk you through just the educational experience that we've built. So as I mentioned previously, you're all part of Rupa University right now. We host these live classes on a weekly basis, and we upload them into our, our uh, library here. So if you do ever miss any class, no problem. You'll have access to it along with the slides once we've had the opportunity to edit them. But if you're interested in a more in-depth experience, we offer boot camps as well. So the one we have upcoming is with Dr. Carrie Jones, our head of medical education here at Rupa Health. And it's regarding connecting the dots on female hormones from PMS to PICOS using the Dutch Complete Test. This is a six week long in-depth boot camp. This boot camp specifically comes with a free Dutch test to do on yourself. So if you are interested in signing up for this boot camp, just visit rupauniversity.com to learn more and you can sign up. Um, now with that, that is the high level of Rupa Health. Uh, that's why we do what we do. We're very passionate about functional medicine, spreading the word on functional medicine. And I think most importantly, Rupa Health is free to sign up for. So you just go to rupahealth.com. You can sign up for free. All you need is an NPI number. We are releasing a program called Physician Authorization in the next couple weeks, hopefully, um, that will allow practitioners whose licenses may be limiting to order to be able to place orders from any one of the tests or any one of the labs that we work with. So if you're not currently licensed in your state or have some trouble, you know, ordering directly from some of the labs, hang tight with us. We are working on it and we will have that program available very soon. Um, I saw a couple questions come into the Q&A, so I'll jump to those real quick. As a practitioner, we pay for testing. Can we get the explanation of results instead of patient getting it? So we won't send the results to the patient without your consent. I think that's something really important to call out. So you have full control of how your patients are receiving their results through Rupa. Um, unless the patient has a account directly with the lab themselves, sometimes labs might send the results to the patient, but Rupa will never send the results to the patients without your consent. Are the patients charged for mobile draws and draws performed at the draw center? Um, this, this is, a uh, one of those questions that I hate giving this response to, but it is the answer. It, it, it depends. Um, it depends on where they're going. But yes, traditionally with mobile phlebotomists, it will have an incurred uh, additional expense, but we'll do our best to be transparent about that price and that cost. And if we're aware that what that cost is, we'll always tell the patients what any additional cost will be with the blood draws. Um, but additionally, you have access to just seeing what mobile phlebotomists or what phlebotomists are in your area as well. So within your settings, which is really cool, you have the bottom tab. So this is the dashboard that you just saw. If I just hop over to my settings here, go down to phlebotomy, you'll be able to see by zip code all the update available options. So I'm in San Francisco here. Click on this, and here we go. Here's my mobile, or my rather my phlebotomy options and the fee associated with it. 
So if you do have any questions, again, we try to be as transparent as possible with that. So with that, y'all, my name is Adrian Martinez. I'm the head of practitioner partnerships here at Root Health. I'm gonna bring up a little showing of my contact information. So if you do have any questions, I'm more than happy to set up a call with you. Rupa Health can work with solo practitioners. It can work with multiple, multiple practitioner clinics. However you want to get it set up, it is very customizable. So please let me know. And depending on how you're operating, I'm more than happy to get a little more into the weeds and, and give you a customized demo of what we can do for you. So I appreciate y'all being able to st stick around with us. Um, again, my name is Adrian Martinez, Head of Practitioner Partnerships here at Rupa Health. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon, and I look forward to speaking with some of you soon.